All right, everyone. Thank you for all of you who have already joined the Hangout on Air. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. I want to make sure everyone who wants to join from the beginning is able to. So just bear with us for a few minutes, and we'll get started uh, very shortly. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to say thank you again to all of you who have attended the sessions this week and today's final session. Uh, we have another great presentation for you today to wrap up Admin Training Week. So, uh, you know, for the benefit of all of you who are maybe stopping by for the first time, we're going to do a short introduction and then we'll get started with the first presentation. So uh, just to introduce myself again real quick, my name is Andrew McGonigal, and I run the day-to-day -day operations of Google Guru. I've been uh, hosting the Hangout on Airs this week, and if you've, uh, if you've used Google Guru at all, um, chances are you've interacted with me in the past. So uh, if you're not familiar with Google Guru, and I hope all of you are at this point, but Google Guru is the number one resource for everything that you need to know about Google Apps, whether you're a Google Apps admin, like many of you, or an end user who is just trying to learn more about Google Apps and learn about the latest tips and tricks. There's something for everybody on our website. A lot of our content that we put out there is created by industry experts. So these are uh, other companies in the Google Apps space, uh, Google Apps users, Google Apps admins, and they really help bring a lot of expert uh, opinions and advice to our website. So. We have over 20 contributors at the moment, and if you're interested in joining our program, uh, you can go to googleguru.com slash contribute. We also have a rapidly growing newsletter that I hope all of you have joined by now, but this is where we send out all of our latest tips and tricks and the latest news about Google Apps to our subscribers. So if you're interested, you can go to googleguru.com slash register to sign up. So today's agenda, first we're going to do this short introduction, and then our first session will be by Kyle Horst of Kirksville Web Design, and he's going to 
give us a uh, really interesting presentation on how you can use Google Sites as a company intranet. And then we'll do a Q&A using the Q&A app on the, uh, on the Hangout. So if you're interested in asking Kyle a question or myself a question, uh, please ask questions through there and we'll get to as many as we can. The second session will be hosted by uh, Justin Gale, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. He did our first session uh, on Tuesday, and he'll be covering mobile device management today. So after his presentation, we'll do one more Q&A session, and then we'll wrap up the, uh, the admin training week. So before we get started, I'd like you to all go to googleguru.com slash session5 to fill out uh, the second to last form that we have for you guys. Um, this is going to help us get your information to send you your free t-shirt if you haven't already filled out our form. And if you have, this will help keep you in the running for the free Chromebook Pixel. And it's also going to help us gauge the audience and see you know, exactly what the audience is today. So with that being said, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, our first presenter today, Kyle Horst. He is the owner and lead designer of Kirksville Web Design and is was actually our very first Google Guru contributor. So he's uh, he's been helping us out for a while now. And Kirksville Web Design is actually the highest rated uh, sites designer in the Google Apps Marketplace. So he's certainly a uh, an expert in on the topic and he's got a great presentation for us today about how to use Google Sites as a company internet so I'm going to hop out of the slideshow real quick and Kyle I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to you so Kyle go ahead and uh, take it away All right. hello everybody thanks for taking the time to uh, to join us today and thanks Andrew for the intro I'll go ahead and turn on my uh, screen share, turn on the presentation, and Andrew, can you verify that's run, yep, running? Yeah, you're, you're ready to go. All right, cool. So, intranets powered by Google Sites. Um, as I'll just get right into it. Uh, kind of like a little background on uh, my business. Uh, we build Google Sites. That's all we do. So really, we're trying to uh, carve out that that niche, and uh, we've really taken uh, pride in building, as I said, over a thousand Google Sites. Uh, we've been privileged to build Google Sites for all sorts of uh, uh, spheres and uh, types of organizations, uh, government, education, nonprofits, private industry. I think we've done it done it all. Uh, we're partners with a lot of Google Apps resellers, so uh, you may not know it, but you may be working with me sort of indirectly. Uh, if you're you know, maybe using a partner like uh, Cloud Bakers in Chicago or you know, one of these um, uh, Google Apps resellers, uh, often I'm their kind of uh, expert in the field. So, uh, And then as Andrew mentioned, we're the uh, top rated in the uh, Google Apps Marketplace with 85 uh, excellent reviews there. So I encourage you to check that out and kind of see what our reputation is like. Um, just a bit about myself, you know, why? first of all you might ask why is it called Kirksville Web Design? People think my name is Kirk for some reason. That's, that's not the case. Um, Kirksville is a small town in Missouri where I started the business. So that's where it gets its name really humble beginnings. Uh, I really love to, uh, to code and to design, so this is a perfect gig for me, you might say. I'm 27, learning Chinese. Ni hao for all our Chinese zhongguo ren <laughs> of viewers. Okay, that was my best attempt at Chinese. All right, so we're covering, you know, basically just an overview of Google Sites for those who don't know what it is. Um, Google Sites for intranet, you know, that's one of the primary purposes of Google Sites. So we're going to be delving, delving into uh, Google Sites, developing and designing those uh, for an internal site. Uh, and I'll just cover the key features of a successful intranet, help you guys kind of plan out 
uh, maybe your next steps in terms of you know planning an intranet um, and just looking at you know what are the benefits what do you really get with this package what do you why is Google Sites a excellent solution and um, I'll kind of cover the elements of the Google, of the Google Sites um, CRM the platform uh, and so I'll just walk through that So just a, a general overview, what is Google Sites? Well, keep in mind that uh, Google Sites is part of the umbrella of Google Apps. So if you're running Google Apps for business, or Google Apps for education, or whatever, you know, you're know you already getting Google Sites as this package. And maybe you didn't know it. Uh, Google Sites is a web building platform. It can be used uh, internally or externally. So we're kind of focusing on the internal aspect today, but uh, you can see many of the public websites we've built for small businesses uh, on our website. So that's why I'm, I'm mentioning when I say, how can you use it? Well, it's uh, internal or external, basically. So, um, and you know, what is, more about what is Google Sites, I think it really is summarized uh, best by uh, Google's own website, easy to create websites for your teams. I mean, that really is it in a nutshell, uh, talking about launching a company intranet. It can't get any faster or easier, I think, than Google Sites to get started, especially if you're already running uh, Google Apps. So what is an intranet? You know, how do we define that? Uh, it's kind of in the name, intra-internal. So it's, it's inclusive. Uh, it's a private, secure web environment. Uh, think about the sort of uh, credibility and uh, certifications you're getting with Google Apps. Those are going to apply uh, to your Google site because it's under that umbrella of Google Apps. It's really awesome to share information, documents, events, you know, when's the next company picnic, you know, these types of things that just keep everyone in the same loop. And uh, that's really essential for a for an organization to have open, free communication, and even passive communication. You don't really have to work hard at uh, maybe emailing people or having to email blasts or something. You're just having this uh, sort of internal web space that is just uh, always running, always available with uh, the information that people are looking for. Uh, the site sharing model, that really is, is the key. That's what's going to make the differentiation between you know, public on the web, as you see here on the right, public on the web versus uh, internal to your Google Apps domain. Uh, mine's Kirksville Web Design, so you can see that there. Even making it very specific uh, to individual email accounts, individual users. So that's uh, really the heart of it, of an, of an intranet, because you can toggle between, you know, everyone, some people, your organization, or you know, just a few individuals when you're starting to run a start of a project or something. Now, uh, for Google uh, admins, uh, Google Apps admins, uh, they can restrict um, these general rules over here, the sharing the visibility options. So if they don't want sites to go public, they can uncheck this. This is available in the Google Apps control panel. So Sites is an intranet solution. Uh, you know, I want to kind of give an argument to why you should use Google Sites. Uh, it's easy on end users. Uh, basically, there's no coding required. You don't necessarily have to hire a developer, a designer, a web guy. So you don't have to keep someone on staff or hire someone to, to build your, your intranet. Um, you can really get started right away quite easily. Easy on the pocketbook, especially if you're already running Google Apps, essentially you're already paying for it. So why not investigate uh, Google Sites, uh, see if it's a good option, see if it fits your requirements for your organization. I seem to cut off a little bit of my next uh, part there, but uh, essentially, you know, you want to create something that's, that's living and growing as an intranet. Uh, you want to which was what Google Sites is good at because you're tying into all the, the integrations. I think that's what I had here, integrations with Google Apps. So you're getting 
calendar in your Google site. You're getting uh, drive folders, you know, your document management. All these things are really tying into the sites. So you have this cohesive uh, Google run intranet, which is a lot of fun uh, and is very easy to get going. And I think that's what I'm showing here uh, with the insert options. You know, you have you know, the, the web essentials, uh, gadgets for a bit more uh, dynamic uh, feeding content and then all the Google apps. So, yeah, it's, just as, it's as easy as like I think three clicks or something. Um, and then like I mentioned, you know, you're getting a Google product. You're getting Google reliability. You're getting 99.99% uptime. So think of that, you know, in terms of uh, weighing Google Sites in the balance versus, I don't know, WordPress or versus um, Papyrus. There's, there's some other solutions out there, SharePoint. Um, and I think this is a quote from Google that quite said it well, you know, bring together the right content into one place. You want to make a hub of people for their information. You know, this is the information age, so why not take advantage of that uh, with sites? So really, you have to start planning, planning for an intranet. Um, and here are just some steps I, I outlined for us. You know, starting a brain trust, uh, because really you have to get together the people um, you know, who are going to be planning this, or you know, just get together a few friends uh, within your organization, a few colleagues that you work well with, and start like you know, generating a proposal maybe for uh, for the Google site, you know, what it could be, what's your vision. Uh, so get together some people with good ideas. Um, determine what kind of intranet your organization needs. You know, an intranet can be many different things for many different organizations. It can be a hub of information. It could be, you know, just links out to all your other group, all your other apps like Gmail or like uh, Salesforce. So it can be like kind of a launch point type of uh, intranet. Uh, it can be a you know, project management site where it's just very specific on one uh, topic or project. Uh, for all those types of sites, you really have to start thinking in, in categories and buckets. So you know, a site is built on its content. So start organizing your content uh, in your mind or in your organization, what makes sense. Uh, sometimes it's by role. Uh, sometimes, like I think about education. Uh, we built an intranet for an uh, educational organization. They did it by role, you know, by teacher, by principals, by superintendents. So maybe it's a by role type of uh, type of buckets. And that kind of also facilitates making a site map, uh, which in turn is going to fuel you know the build of the actual intranet. Um, and also, you know, like I said in the beginning, starting a brain trust, you kind of also want to start thinking about, you know, who are, who's really going to be the, the stewards of the intranet, I call it, or like kind of like the, uh, the admins, the owners. And then who's going to be growing and building the site? Who are the content owners? And then thinking about, uh, you know, really populating the thing and getting it to launch. So here, designing an intranet, uh, I kind of broke it down into three things that many times, uh, this is how I break it down to clients about their intranet. You know, when they're in the initial stages of planning, you know, this is what they need to think about. There's three things, structure, function, and look and feel. That's really all it boils down to. You know, let's not make uh, making an intranet more difficult than it has to be. I mean, really, it's just these three things. What does it look like? Uh, how does it need to, you know, uh, what kind of integrations does it need? What workflows does it need? Uh, what's the structure? So that's kind of like what we were planning before, uh, kind of thinking about your site map, thinking in buckets, categorizing things. So really, your vision is going to center around these three things. So that first one was structure. Uh, every site needs a foundation. 
So to start thinking in, in buckets to facilitate that, uh, really I've shown two ways to do that, you know, different uh, methods, if you will. Uh, you could create a sort of a spreadsheet that helps you map out uh, maybe the net main navigation bar and sub pages under those. Uh, this would be a more of a visual type of representation uh, for planning structure. Or you can create a, sort of more like a, a horizontal breakout of uh, how pages are uh, fitting within one another. Maybe if that's, you know, if you have a deeper site, you know, you might start planning that way because you know, we're getting into really fourth level and beyond uh, type site structure. Or here on the right is more of a, uh, actually this is, this can also be used in conjunction with the spreadsheet. But once you have uh, your buckets, your pages in mind, start building a drive folder that is called the intranet or called intranet content and start just building documents, dropping spreadsheets, dropping images, um, you know, documents filled with ideas for the page. So each folder is essentially a page in the intranet. So that kind of helps you structure it, you know, in your, in the planning phase. So it's like the, the folder structure will mimic the site structure. And I love it when clients uh, follow through with this kind of a method because essentially, you know, I know where to look to build the entire internet if they, you know, were to hire me or something, but, or, you know, if they assign someone to build the internet, you know, it's all there in drive and they just have to work at maybe, you know, some copy and paste or, uh, you know, integrating, embedding the features that you're looking for. So maybe use drive and leverage that to, to build your content. So the other, other key component was, was function. So when you're building the intranet, what do you need to, uh, what does it need to accomplish? You know, do you imagine that, uh, you know, it's going to have calendar on there? So that's what I mean by like the standard sites functions. Uh, those are just things like the announcements type page, which is kind of like a blog. Uh, those are featured right, uh, right here. Well, those are gadgets, but um, you can, you know, funnel in recent posts from your blog to your home page, funnel in uh, recently updated files from your file cabinet type pages. So in looking at function, you know, think about how is information flowing and what needs to be displayed maybe on the home page. Um, but also function in terms of, you know, what else do we need to tie into this intranet? You know, I mentioned integrations, you know, do you need uh, app script? Do you need calendars? Do you need charts, drive? These are all these things right here. Uh, drive, Google Plus, Google Groups. You know, do you need a forum on your Google uh, site, your intranet, to make it more social? You know, take advantage of Google Groups, uh, Maps, YouTube. Maybe you're making an uh, intranet based around training for your employees or your staff. You know, inter integrating lots of uh, YouTube videos or Google Drive videos uh, may be something you need to look uh, forward to and plan for. And really that's gonna facilitate dynamic content. You, know, you don't want this to be just brochureware. You know, this isn't just, uh, just looking at it and uh, it'd be staying static is what I mean. You really want it to be a living, growing, breathing site. So that's what the functions are gonna do for you. Um, other questions, uh, other uh, Google Apps script powered functions. You know, do you need a uh, staff directory? You know, that you can sort and filter. Uh, do you need to subscribe to page changes or site changes? so that people can stay more informed, receive emails of what's going on in the intranet. Uh, Google Apps Script integrates really well with sites, so uh, you know, maybe you need to plan for a Google Apps Script developer you know, to hire them on to build a, a gadget for you or to build a, a sort of workflow. 
then thir thinking about third-party plugins and gadgets, that's why I put the, the Twitter feed here. You know, you can integrate Twitter or Yammer or um, Facebook, you know, making it more social in a way. So you're not just limited to Google products. Uh, you can iframe in or gadget in uh, a lot of other third-party apps if they give you that provision or like an API to work with. Uh, some common functions I see requested were um, you know, for gadgets, calendar is pretty much like a must-have. But also I've been seeing a lot of people want that sort of social element to their intranet. So tying in Google+, Plus, uh, using the commenting feature in Google Sites, using Google Groups, you know, all these things that make it more of like a back and forth, more of an interactive type of, of intranet. That's been kind of a trend here uh, lately. And I can see it continuing that way. So the third element, we had, uh, we had structure, we just covered function, and next is look and feel. So what is the internet going to look like, basically? Um, you want it to be on brand. You want it to fit with your company, you know, fit with your company culture, uh, fit with what you think it should look like because you don't want your Google site to stick out like a, like a sore thumb and be this like, uh, hideous thing that no one wants to visit. You know, you want to make it uh, inviting, basically, and you want to make it fit in with the rest of, you know, your your company's look and feel. So looking at things like public website, that obviously good inspiration, marketing materials, uh, branding guidelines, those are the things I'm asking for from clients when they really want to uh, consider look and feel, because it's important. People are into you know, user experience. Uh, and many people want things to be clear, and concise. They want to know where to find things, and they want to find them quickly. So maybe you know, look past the out-of-the-box Google Sites options. I know they're tempting, and they're there, the templates. But uh, you know, think about building really something from scratch, or building something very basic, uh, and then improving the look and feel of it. Instead of trying to, uh, I guess, you know, fit in, fit this uh, square peg into a round hole, so to speak, which is sometimes what you get locked into one of those templates. It, it feels like that. So to keep it on brand, you have all these resources: Google Web Fonts, you have uh, backgrounds, themes uh, to work with and upload, but also you have uh, page layout. Uh, and page elements. So looking at your public website, you know, are there certain sort of styling features that you want to carry over into your intranet just to make it feel holistic? So you can utilize uh, inline CSS, uh, which is, I don't know if, it's kind of hard to see here, but down here is an example of that edit HTML box. Uh, using HTML boxes, which are, are different, sorry to get a little confused there, but uh, there's also an, an HTML box you can insert that gives you a little bit more flexibility to style things. And then there's the graphics, like the uh, uh, themes, colors, and fonts dashboard in the manage site part of your Google site. So you can utilize all those things to really make it feel cohesive within your, your organization. So I wanted to kind of just show off uh, some examples because people obviously want to know, uh, you know, what can my Google site look like? What can our intranet look like? And uh, the possibilities are, are endless. So these are some that we developed uh, and designed. You know, some are more of a dashboard type of feel where they want to click uh, on specific areas and receive support. That's what this uh, site was about. Uh, for Monash University in Australia. Um, or maybe it's uh, you know, Teach for America. They wanted to uh, help their alumni and, uh, what was it, their candidates. They call them something else, though, their core, you know, to, to find the resources that need, they needed out in the field. So they needed a web space to facilitate that. 
or you know maybe it's more of like that uh, that dashboard with the social integrations so that people can log on maybe as their you know company homepage and get to where they need to go see what's new in the organization and move on uh, some kind of same idea with uh, this flagship one and uh, here's another one just showing off you know it can look bright and uh, fun inviting modern clean uh, doesn't have to look archaic and like it's from 1990 or something I don't even know if the internet was around in 1990 I don't know, whatever <laughs> I was born in 87 so I don't really know I was like three um, what is oh sorry I went out the presentation mode here sorry about that okay so then I was just going to conclude here with kind of the uh, the takeaways if you go to guru com. that's where I've loaded some freebies for you guys for joining uh, a free Google Apps icon pack which is great for an intranet because you just want people to like click on visually you know Gmail or Drive or whatever and it can link off to that application uh, there's a coupon for a free design draft from me and a quote or uh, if you really want to dive in and start using a blank Google site to get started, there's a template there as well. So I think that's uh, is that the last thing. Questions? Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Um, let's uh, let's go ahead and dive into some questions. It looks like we have uh, a lot of really good questions here about Google Sites. So the the top one um, the top one that I see here is what's the best way to integrate Google Sites with an SQL database. So if uh, allow people to edit their own uh, demographic information but not display that to other users. Hmm. I've never gotten that requirement before. <laughs> or I've never heard much about it. Um, I can just say, you know, from what I've used previously, if we needed a database type functionality, it's really been coming from Google Apps Script uh, utilizing Google uh, spreadsheets. So you kind of have to keep in that Google world, I think, you know, for that type of uh, tie-in for a database. Uh, maybe App Engine can be used, uh, but I'm not too familiar with that. Okay. Um, let's, let's see what else we got. And Kyle, can you, uh, can you switch out of the presentation? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's all right. Um, so another another good one here. Uh, what are some things to consider when designing a Google site for mobile? Okay, yeah, that's definitely a good question, especially with a lot of people chiming in on responsive uh, web design. How does Google Sites fit that? So Google Sites, they have like a mobile mode that's available. I don't always recommend it, depending on the type of uh, site that you have whether it's more customized. I don't really like it that much, but it's available. Um, really, I kind of think of uh, designing for mobile as an objective of the, of the full website. So, you know, thinking about color choices, font choices for legibility, you know, on a smartphone or a tablet, font sizes, you know, these are just kind of general rules of web design that you want to make it uh, so people don't have to pinch, you know, all the time on their smartphone. So if that's an objective, you know, to make it awesome on smartphones, then, you know, that can be done. It just has to be tailored that way. Great. Okay. That makes sense. Um, here's another one. Can I restrict viewing of a Google site to specific sub-organizations? So an example for uh, EDUs would be allowing only teachers to see a Google site and not students. Right, so what a admin, Google Apps admin can do is create Google groups. So basically groups of contacts within your organization. If you have a Google group that's all the teachers in your organization, what you can do is at the, at, uh, in the page level permissions of your Google site, or even at the site level, you can just invite that, uh, that group of contacts. So just teachers, for example. But you kind of have to do that preliminary work. You know, there has to be a group there for you to use. 
So I would contact your, your admin, you know, to set that up. Okay. Um, let's see. This is, uh, looks kind of a, I guess, kind of a general question, but is there a way to give Google Sites a more updated look? So I think for an example was um, a, for, a full horizontal bar uh, edge to edge of links. Mm. That makes, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So there is, um, you can think of it in two ways. You can have like a fixed uh, pixel uh, width to a site, or you can have a percentage width. So I think what you really you know, would want to use there, if you want it to be more full page type experience, then you would want a percentage option because it's going to fill you know, the window that it's in. So you know, just design with that in mind, design with a repeating header maybe so that it's, uh, making that bar, you know, extend as long as it needs to be on any device or, you know, widescreen monitor or something. Okay. Um, another one here. Is there a way to notify people when new content is posted to a Google site? Yeah. Well, it, I guess it kind of depends on if your uh, Google site is public or private. Because there's two methods for each. If it's public, they can use the uh, uh, the RSS feed, or they can. I think there's a subscribe to to page changes or site changes there for public websites. Now, if it's private, um, there's a, a gadget developed by my uh, my colleague, my uh, Google Apps Script developer, Romain Villard. Uh, I probably butchered his name, but <laughs> uh, he basically made a, uh, a button where people can subscribe to changes and just be viewers of the page, and that works internally, so that's a gadget I would look at. Great. Um, is there a way to have a search function that will allow me to find site content as well as embedded uh, or linked to Google Docs or uh, you know, Google Drive files. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so the search engine in Google Sites, it's going to be looking at uh, the content that's on the page. Now, when you have, when you're iframing in something or you're embedding a spreadsheet or something, or you have a link out to a spreadsheet. Google will not go in and crawl, you know, that, that iframe, or they won't go in and crawl that document. Uh, so there's not that provision. So if you're thinking about that, um, you know, try to try to tag your content in some way with like the page name or the uh, or some content on the page or even the comments. Uh, you can do that to kind of tag your uh, content for the search engine. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, another question here. So when when you're building a site, are you are you editing the headers of the site um, using tools that Google provides? And I guess they're referring specifically to the appearance. Okay. So I guess that kind of comes down to, you know, what I do is I, I'm designing backgrounds and headers and and you know I think that's maybe what they're they're talking about because mm -hmm. usually the header uh, well I just basically say I, I utilize the backgrounds a lot to customize the appearance so it's not just going to be your default Google uh, sites options um, though those will give you some you know options there but they're kind of more limited Okay. Um, another question, I think, pertaining more specifically to admins. Um, we got it here. Uh, is there a log to find out who has changed the site or uh, recent activity, you know, as far as you know, changes to a site or doc uploads, that sort of thing? Gotcha. So I think that's part of the. Um the sidebar gadgets that can be enabled, there's a recent site activity there. And I'll say, like, you know, Bob uploaded document to the file cabinet. And it'll kind of, like, tag who did it, what page they did it to. 
and even what time they did it. So uh, I think it's just called Recent Site Activity, and it's a gadget for the sidebar. All right. I think... I think that does it as far as questions um, for Kyle. Uh, Kyle, thanks a lot. If you want to say, you know, say thank you to everybody, or say, you know, finish it off. Go ahead. Yes, definitely. Thank you, thank you for joining. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hop right back into uh, my presentation right now, and um, then we'll we'll start the next portion of our uh, of our presentation. So go back in here. All right, so Kyle, thank you very much for uh, showing us all about Google Sites and how you can use them for company intranet or you know internal or external use. There's certainly a, a ton of different uses for Google Sites. Um, so before we, we get started on the next session, uh, I just wanted to ask you guys to fill out our next Google form. Um, and now that I think about it, Give me one second here. I need to uh, make, make sure this form is live. Let's see here. And all right, so now we should be good to go. OK, so I'll go. Sorry about that. I'm going to go right back into our presentation. All right. So once again, if you can go to uh, googleguru.com slash session six, this will be the last form of the week, I promise. So um, if you'd like to still be in the running for the Chromebook Pixel, please go ahead and fill that out. And then uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Justin Gale again. He's going to be our, our last presenter, so he'll, uh, he'll have started off the week and closed the week. So uh, Justin is the, the lead architect for VRP, um, and he's got a really great presentation for us today about mobile device management. So Justin, I'm going to hop out of this, uh, with, hop out of this screen share here and pass the presentation over to you. So... Justin, go ahead and uh, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. What an awesome honor to be the uh, the lead speaker and the closing speaker of Google Guru's first annual Admin Week. Hope you guys do this like every year, every quarter. There's just so much stuff changing in this field. Got to stay on top of it. You guys do such a great job putting together, you know, the daily newsletters, the tips and tricks, the videos from all the amazing authors out there. Just glad to be a part of it. So with that, let's kick off into some fun stuff to close the week for admins, mobile device management. There we go. Should be up and running. As some of you may know, my name is Justin Gale, lead architect for BRP. A lot of you may know us by name. We make some of the absolute coolest, most amazing recreational vehicles on the planet, on land, sea, and uh, with our Rotex engines, we power things in the air. Pretty big company. We're in 30-plus locations, 30-plus countries, 40-plus locations. A little bit more about me for people who don't know. I'm the senior Google Apps admin here. Like a few others, one of the first certified administrators from Google, top contributor on Google's Enterprise Connect community. I'm also a moderator over in a few G Plus uh, communities. If you pop in with questions, you'll find me over there, not only answering questions, but asking questions of other people as well. Uh, the space is such a great one to learn from everybody else, and there are always experts in different areas all over the place. Also, my own blog, and you can find me on G+. With that, I thought let's kick off, talk a bit about mobile devices, uh, specifically mobile device management within Google. When I did my admin presentation on Tuesday, we kind of forgot to mention that, hey, a lot of this stuff really is for the uh, 
Google Apps for Business, Education, and Government Customers. The free version of Google Apps has a whole lot of features, but it does not have everything. And mobile device management is one of those. Now, then we have a little quote from Google here. It's really about managing your organization's mobile devices, right? You don't need anything on premise. It's Google, it's in the cloud. They do give you some great tools to get you started. You know, and you can do some base security, even remotely wipe your users' devices. You know, that's all fine and great, but a lot of folks came here to hear me and hear my opinions because they know I've got them. And one of them, of course, is, you know, this MDM solution from Google is great and everything, but tell us what it's really about, Justin. Well, it's not a full-blown MDM solution, right? It's not intended to be a mobile iron or air watch or anything. It doesn't support those little app stores. You can't whitelist or blacklist mobile apps. They don't have all the policy settings that some of these other tools may have at the moment. Uh, again, it's Google. That's the key thing. What does it have right now? But to me, one of the biggest things about it is it's free. It's always improving. It can provide you some of the basic security controls that many of, us, many of us used to have and use in those old BlackBerry days, right? We used to have basic device security. You know, you had a screen lock. You had a pin or password, and you could remotely wipe the device if it were lost or reported stolen. Google gives you that right out of the box. You just need to activate it and configure it. That's really pretty easy. So what can you do with their, you know, their MDM solution? Well, the, the first real key thing is, is you can configure all their settings by organizational unit. Anyone who caught our presentation earlier in the week knows that Google Apps really today is all about organizational units. That's kind of the structure it uses to decide who has rights to what, what features, et cetera. You know, do I have Google Plus turned on for this group, yes or no? They do that grouping by organizational unit. Mobile device security works the same way. Now, since that's at an org unit level, that means, for example, that user Justin Gale can only have one device policy applied to him. So you got to kind of think this out a little bit in advance. What else can you do? Well, you can control what devices connect to your, your domain. All right, since it's by, by organization, and in each organization you can have a policy. You can say whether or not they can automatically connect or whether they manually connect. If they manually connect and need to be approved, as a Google Apps admin, you have to approve each and every device. Right? So you may have a specific set of people, say, say key leaders of the organization or key designers that are working on such confidential stuff that you want to make absolutely sure that you know just which device they have and are using. And Google Apps will let you do that by saying, you know, I specifically approve this device for Alex or Colin or John. And you can see the status when they're approved. What else? Well, you can also view all these devices that you have configured. I thought I'd throw up a little example here and we'll kind of use the same one throughout the presentation. Whether the devices are, are Google Sync devices or Android devices with Policy Client, you know, you can get a lot of information about them. Uh, and that's really key. You can see whose it is, what it is, when it was last synced, is it approved, is it wiping, um, all sorts of great things like that. And it's really one of those things that scales. The more information, the more devices you get in there, the more variety of information you're able to see. If you use their solution with Android devices today, and I say Android because, you know, we can only hope that they carry this stuff through to iOS and other devices, I have the option of even getting a, a bit of a limited inventory. I can't blacklist or whitelist, but I can see some of the apps on specific devices, and I can even query apps on specific devices. So we kind of see here's a sample. We can see a Hangouts app. I can query all my devices and see, well, who installed Hangouts or who installed the remote desktop application. 
Now, when we started using this a couple of years ago, Google didn't have any of these features. Again, it goes back to my point that Google's really been born of the cloud, always evolving and always throwing in new things and not charging you for it. But you got to go back periodically and say, what's new since I last used it, since I last pulled back the covers and took a look. So all this stuff that I'm telling you today is current as of 1230 this morning. So we have this great thing that we're talking about. Google Apps, you know, mobile device management. Well, what do they, you know, what do they support? What devices can I use with it? What can I connect? Can I bring anything that I want? You know, BYOD. Well, the official statement from Google is, of course, they cover Android, iOS, Windows Phone, smartphones, tablets, using Microsoft Exchange Active Sync, such as BlackBerry 10. And you say that to a room full of people and they go, what, what does that mean? So short answer, it means you can use anything that's, you know, really a current Android or anything that supports, uh, you know, talking to Exchange, uses Active Sync. Google calls it Google Sync because they've licensed the technology from Microsoft, kind of rebranding it and doing their own thing a little bit with it. So it's still based on that. If you've got some of those older devices, you know, you're kind of out of luck. The only options you really have are Pop and IMAP. You can use those and sync your data. However, we cannot manage those devices. That's not a Google thing. That's a limitation of POP and IMAP protocols. Back in the day, you were never able to manage them. So I know a lot of you came here because Andrew said, hey, Justin's going to give us some how to use it. So let's talk about a real world example. Right? Everyone always wants to know what we can really do with this. So let's use these tools modify our Google Apps domain and add two new org units. One that we can do mobile device syncing to Google, and one where we say, hey, we don't want anybody to sync. Anybody in this org cannot sync. If they are syncing, it's going to stop them from syncing. Why? Well, easy. You know, we might want to restrict it. Uh, we might have some people who are temporaries, contractors, you know, students, interns, uh, or just the type of people that have access to information that you don't want leaving your facility on a mobile device. On the other hand, you know, you might want to take the opportunity to actually lock down a little bit more of that syncing. Make sure that anybody who is syncing has a pin or password on their device, you know, screen lock, timeout. Really, it's about protecting your data and protecting their device, and Google can help you. So how would we do this? Well, we talked about this a bit the other day in the admin panel, creating new organizations. It's really pretty easy to do. It takes you but a few clicks. We wind up going over to users. On the users on the right-hand side, we see a little box for organizations. And we can create a couple of new ones. So for the purposes of my example, I've created one called Users Restricted Sync and Users Test Mobility Policy. There's nobody in them yet but we created them for the example. Now that we've got those created, we've got to put a little policy on them in mobile device policy. Again, using that admin panel, we can go into device management, mobile and device management settings, kind of a familiar looking screen for those who may have already gone into it before. Then we get the great policy set up. Now these are org specific, so at the very top of your screen, be very careful that you highlight in red the specific org that you're looking for. First one we want to go through and do is, oh, I advanced a little bit on us. First one we want to go do is the test mobility policy. And we want to go down to the general settings, and I want to talk about them for a minute here because they're extremely important to note. There's four checkboxes you need to hit. You know, they are enable Android Sync, enforce policy, enable Google Sync, and enforce policy. So if you enable Sync, it's pretty much just that, right? The type of device can connect, they can get their email, etc. If you enforce policy with Google Sync devices, you know, like iPhones, Windows phones, etc. 
they will instantly be subject to whatever policy we set below. On Android devices, they may or may not be subject and they may or not report. So on Android devices, the real key takeaway is that enforce policies needs to be set, even if you don't have a policy. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Sounds a little strange. You know, you want these four boxes checked, really, if you're doing mobile sync of any kind. You don't have to have anything else, but have some of this stuff checked because then you'll be able to get reporting on the devices. Now we'll scroll down a little bit further on there, and this is where I'd like to keep setting up that secure, you know, synchronizing that we all knew and loved from the Windows days, you know, the Blackberry days, etc. I want device passwords on all my devices. I'll take a simple password, nothing complex, four character minimum length, right? We'll automatically lock the screen after 30 minutes. But we will check the box here for a number of invalid passwords. You know, hey, if somebody grabs my phone and tries to get on it and can't figure it out after 10 times, you know, let's wipe the device. Uh, a lot of people kind of go, I don't know about that. But if you think about it, you know, any kind of lock is just a simple lock. And given enough time, people will go through it. Do you have the type of information on your phone personally? you know, that you're embarrassed about, that you might have a, a security issue, right? You might have a file on there with, a, you know, some passwords, some banking information, other confidential or private information that you don't want shared. And the same holds true for company data, right? You don't want this information necessarily out there. You may be talking about product development, strategy. Uh, you may be talking about students and you do not want your comments shared in the public. So the idea of having somebody get access to your phone without your authorization would not be a good thing. So basic protection, just a real good thing to have in general. Finally, keep scrolling down just a tick more. Two more key settings to make all this work. Enable application auditing and allow user to remote wipe. Now that's not the remote wipe for us admins. That's to actually let the users find and wipe the devices on their own just in case they lost it on a weekend, had it stolen, etc. They don't have to call the admins to clean their devices up. Now let's create a policy pretty similar, but this time, you know, just to make it so devices can't sync, so people can't sync their data. How do we do that? Again, at the top level, you know, in mobility here, make sure you're focused on that user's restricted sync organization. That should be in red. Look at our general settings. Make sure the top four are unchecked. Hit save. Fundamentally, that's it. However, that's the key however because Google doesn't mention this. you got to kind of learn this from experience or people like, uh, myself or others where I learned it from. A lot of you may still have POP and IMAP protocols turned on. These are real old-fashioned protocols for email use. They're not buried with your mobility settings. They're actually hidden under your Gmail settings. Some people have those on for their entire organization. Some people have them turned off. Good to know which way it is. And as long as you don't have any other systems synchronizing mail where you need to turn them on or keep them on, I'd recommend turning them off. Very easy to do. Go to Google Apps, icon in the admin panel, Gmail advanced settings. Pick your org. In this case, you know, really want to do that against that user's restricted sync org. Find that setting for POP and IMAP and check the box to disable it. Now we've got a pretty secure organization. So let's kind of review some of that. All right? We actually created two orgs with very distinct sets of policy. You know, we enabled Android Sync. We enforced policy. Google Sync enforced policy. We set a pin. Important to note, because I did see this question come up, um, 
pattern, swipe, thumbprint are not allowed. It's not so much a Google constraint, ironically. You know, all this stuff was based on all the old sync protocols that Microsoft wrote. They wrote some great stuff called Active Sync. Google took it called Google Sync. It's and then they, you know, rewrote their own version for Android. And it still doesn't support pattern. It doesn't support swipe. Doesn't support thumbprint. So if a user has those, they will have to change those to meet the new standards. Granted, kind of a step back, but to meet the new standards that you're setting. In our example, we set a non-complex password. You know, basically a pin. Now, why is that that I I recommend pins instead of passwords? If you've ever tried to unlock your phone, how much stuff do you really want to key in? You know, I've had people tell me, hey, they like passwords and they do complex passwords on their phone. And that's great until you, you know, have the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious with capital letters and small letters and symbols and every time you're trying to type that on your phone. So I tend to avoid that and just go with something a little easier. You know, if you're going to do pins or if you're going to do passwords, do something that's fairly easy to type over and over and over again on your phone. Uh, locking the screen, of course, wiping the device. Key other ones, application auditing and allow remote device. On the other policy group, of course, all we did was disable sync, nothing else. Now, for those that haven't done it, haven't actually implemented this, Here's kind of what happens when you do it in these scenarios. So I move a user with a mobile device. Everything's working. Bang, we're trying to set them up in my new mobile policy. So what happens to that Android user? Well, Gmail stops syncing. They get an alert on their phone. They get prompted to install Google Apps device policy. They think they're working. They get another alert. They need to activate Google device, Google Apps device policy. They have to comply with all your settings. They have to set a pin or password if not present. It sounds a little long-winded. It is a little long-winded. I support an organization with about a thousand devices today. I've gone through this process probably several thousand times for Android and hundreds of times for iOS devices or Google Sync devices. Ironically, a lot simpler. I take that iPhone user and I put them into this new test mobility policy and what happens? Almost instantly their phone pops up and says, hey, you have to set a password and that's it. There's no additional software to load, no additional things to reconfigure. If they already have a pin or password, there's nothing to acknowledge, and they have no idea. It's not so much a, it is a Google thing, and it isn't. It's tied with Active Sync, Google Sync, whereas Android's using a more robust utility, that uh, Google Apps device policy. It's going to give us more features, but at the same time, you know, it gives us a few more challenges. It's not that one's good or bad. It's just that as an admin, as somebody rolling these things out, you know, you really want to know what to expect because not everybody has access to bunches of Android devices, bunches of iPhone or iOS devices, Windows devices to see what happens when you turn all these things on. Now, on the other hand, if I take somebody who's synchronizing just fine today and I move them into that restricted sync, what happens? Pretty much their phone stops syncing. They get a little policy type error on each one saying that sync is not allowed and that's it. So let's think about that. What does that mean? I don't wipe their device when I stop them syncing. Kind of an important note. Just says, hey, no more. Door is shut. The flow of information is over. I bring this up because these are the types of things that people like to know about. Why? You might say, hey, deep provisioning. Maybe your process is you're a BYO shop and you don't wipe devices for whatever reason when someone leaves the company, but you stop them syncing. Or you're thinking about stopping that sync so that uh, they can't sync while you figure out what to do with their account for some reason. So again, just things to be aware of as an admin. 
Not all the kinds of things you're going to easily find spelled out by Google, so I thought I'd try to put something together for you. So what is the conclusion about this? Well, I kind of touched on it already. Android devices, love them to death. You know, they're the most Google-friendly, cutting edge for Google Apps, using all the features, functions, etc. But they aren't the absolute smoothest for rolling out because they are rolling out so much more complexity, uh, functionality, capabilities, etc iOS devices a little bit smoother to roll out because they don't have that policy client that Android currently has. And I say currently, right? Thinking ahead. All those people who love their iPhones and iOS devices. If you've been on Google for a while, what have you seen? A while ago, you used to see the Drive, Hangouts, Everything was a separate app on iOS, right? You needed to sign in to each individual one. And then sort of quietly in that always evolving spirit that Google has, they've been tying these apps together so that when you sign into one, all the other apps know it. If you use the Gmail app, you know, your Google Drive app knows about it. Uh, you know, one can only think that if Google's tying all these things together, continually improving that ecosystem, maybe one day they will have some of these policies. Don't know. Another key point, though, about activation is that Google Sync, a little bit different than Android Sync. If I make a change to my policy, that Android device may not recognize it right away. So. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say I forgot to put on a screen lock and suddenly I put on a screen lock of five minutes because I'm going high security or something. Those Android phones may not start screen locking immediately. Just like web browsers and everything else, there's a little bit of a cookie session token on those. It takes a while for those to refresh. You can force sign out all those sessions via the admin panel, we talked about it the other day, or wait. On the other hand, those Google Sync devices, yeah, they're going to reflect the new policy almost immediately. Just little things to be aware of. So, now that I'm using it, what can I do with the devices? You know, I've got this great thing. Tell me more. So, Android devices have a few more capabilities than iOS devices. Again, we kind of hope so. They're a little bit more complex, but more and more features, functionality coming from Google first. I can block them, remote wipe them, wipe account, delete, view the details, including app auditing. What does that mean, block a device? Well. Let's pretend that somebody's synchronizing their phone and you decide, hey, you know, I don't know that I want them synchronizing their phone. And you don't have to do an org and prevent them that way. You can actually block a device. Just like you can improve a device, you can actually tech chick that a lot. Check a little box on it and say block the device. Now remote wipe, we all know what that is. A little scary because your users get no vote when you click remote wipe. Device resets, wipes everything on it. It may or may not take the SD card. I know that sounds a little confusing, but Google and the device manufacturers are kind of playing with words a little bit on whether or not those SD cards are the internal cards or the external cards. So your results may honestly vary from one device to the next about whether or not pictures stored on that memory chip are being wiped out. Now, Android did start doing something really cool, especially from a BYOD standpoint, called wipe account. So I bring my device to the office. I've got my personal Gmail account on it, my corporate Gmail account, uh, my, you know, my Yahoo account, all my other accounts on the device. And then one day I win the lottery, and someone decides, hey, 
we need to get rid of his stuff. In the old days, it was real simple. Person leaves, one option, wipe the device and have an unhappy customer. Google's given us something new called wipe account. You hit that option and almost instantly just their corporate Google account is wiped from the device. It's extremely fast, extremely painless, doesn't wipe out pictures or any of that other stuff on the device, just everything related to that particular Google account. And finally on Android, if you'd enable that application auditing, you get that cool list of things that are installed on the device. Now for Google Sync devices, a little bit more limited, kind of more like the old Exchange and Blackberry days. I can block it, I can wipe it, I can delete the device from my inventory, and I can view just some basic details. Whose is it? What is it? What's the version, etc. Kind of looks like this a little bit, right? Device management details. I've got device ID, whose device it is, what's their email address, model, OS, type of device, last sync and status. This gets into that approved, unapproved, is the device being wiped, etc., or deleted. A couple neat things to note. Almost everything we see and then some we can actually do querying on. You can do sorting. You kind of get the idea from the little up arrow by name. Again, it's Google. It's one of those things that's always evolving, always improving, and always changing. The only thing that I've talked about that you can't do as far as inventory is you can't export the list of software on each device. I can dump out the huge device list, everything I got, bring it into a spreadsheet, track it for historical purposes. I just can't get that software list. But I guess that's somewhere coming down the road from Google. They do a lot of neat stuff like that. So, Kind of wrapping up a little bit, what kind of summary reports as well? Because besides all that great detail, there's also some cool high-level summary. I give you the number of active and mobile devices, mobile device types, you know, kind of give you this graph of how many Androids versus non-Android devices. I can also tell you how many, you know, of your devices by different operating system, give you sort of a flavor of what's really out there. Uh, you know, are things going exploding in one direction or another? You have a lot of devices that need to be updated. Just jumping back again, Think about that when we talked about forcing an inventory, forcing all devices through here. We gave you kind of insight into something else interesting from a security standpoint. Is everybody staying current? Is everybody staying on the latest operating system for their devices? Or do you have people who might not be properly updating their devices? You know, if you, if you don't know, if you don't have the ability to see it, you're guessing. If you use the tools in the way I'm describing, you can get insight into that and at least try to update the folks that need to be updated or educate them to say, hey, there's security reasons you want to do this. There's performance reasons you want to do this. And knowing, you know, is half the battle. Google does a great job on giving you those tools to at least know what's going on. So, Kind of talked about the various summary reports, etc., and wanted to show you what they all look like. So here they are. This was from uh, my domain recently. You can see the breakdown. We have a lot more Android than non-Android devices. We have quite a few devices. They can give you all different breakdowns of time. You know, over one month, six month, three month, active currently versus active for 30 days and you go what's the difference in theory they should be almost identical right but based on holidays people coming and going uh, typically you have a lower number of a higher number of devices active over a longer period of time and then the third graph that we kind of talked about showing you all the different versions of your operating system you know we can see here 
kind of clearly a little bit that on iOS 7, most of our devices are there. A few stragglers on some lower versions. Again, when we look at kind of the Android stuff, you know, pretty good mix. It's biased towards the newer stuff. Um, you know, kind of a quick primer, quick intro to mobile device management. It's really a cool area. It's evolving constantly. The documentation from Google, not too bad, always improving. There's always folks like me willing to help out, share what we know about it, and talk about it with everybody else. And I know I got going a little bit fast. I got started a little bit early and thought we'd open it up to any questions people might have. Great stuff, Justin. Uh, yeah, it looks like we have got some good questions here. Um, here's one, I think, and stop me if you if you may have covered this, but so in a BYOD environment, can an admin uh, selectively wipe only company data and not personal data? On Android devices, if you are using the Google Apps device policy, you have the option to wipe only that corporate account. So that's yes. And All right, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, have I used that before? Yes. How many times? A lot. Why? Because I wanted to be sure that it worked the way it sounds like, and it does. It's really fast. It's really quick, and, I mean, it's, it's just neat. Leaves your personal stuff completely alone. Now, you, so you said that was for that was for Android. How does what's the is there anything similar for iOS? At this point in time, iOS still really works like uh, you know Microsoft devices do, based on Active Sync, and they just don't have the option in there uh, to support that profile level wiping of accounts. Gotcha. Um, one, all right. one key thing, Andrew, I forgot. I did not sure. put my presentation, probably should have. The iOS Gmail app is not yet something that can be managed. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something to keep in mind. I say yet, you know, we're all real hopeful that one of these days Google will make that a managed app. At this time, it's not. So just be aware you could put somebody in a restricted sync example and they can still do that uh, Gmail app on their iPhone. Mm -hmm. All right, so another question here. Um, so for mobile device management and contacts, uh, do you know of a way to get domain contacts to show on an iOS device uh, across the company and... Um, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> God, I love these questions. It's like our own guys wrote these or something. So, <laughs> yes, the biggest key on iOS devices is do not set up the account as a Gmail account. Set it up as an Exchange account. People are going, wait a second, why do I do that? Well, when you set it up as an Exchange account, then it recognizes that whole address book. I just went through this last week for some other things to learn more about it. When you set it up as an exchange account, you go into your contacts, you have an option groups. Tap groups, you'll see a corporate directory and you can find anybody in your company. So that's for, that's for company uh, contacts. Is there a way to uh, have a, a group of contacts outside of a company that all users can access on their mobile device? So that almost sounds like a great leading question for Flash Panel and others, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, there's, uh, you know, native to Google, there was something called shared contacts. For right. folks not familiar with it, these were for email addresses that are not part of your Google Apps domain. Uh, example might be a list of suppliers and their key email addresses and contacts. That's available to all your folks, um, but there are some constraints around it. 
Uh, Flash Panel and a few others have come up with solutions where you can specifically create contacts and push those right into the actual Gmail contacts of all people in your organization and maintain it centrally. So I don't know that it quite answered it, but those are kind of the solutions around it. And mm -hmm. feel free to ping me, you know, separately if you want to talk more about it. I know a few more things probably. Great. Um, this one, uh, this question here looks like just more of a uh, general admin um, question, but so for if you're setting up, if you're a new organization setting up a BYOD uh, program across your your company, how important is a is a written policy for setting up that program? So I love this one, right? One of my favorite topics: the written policy, the technical policy. Written policy makes the lawyers happy. Mm -hmm. Has absolutely no bearing on what actually happens, right? I can write on a piece of paper, don't do this. It does not technically stop people. But if you live in America or any of the other places where lawyers abound, it's an extremely good idea to have that written policy in place first. It's also a great idea to use multiple organizations in Google and transition everybody into an organization uh, unit, you know, that corresponds to policy. Great example, you develop that mobile policy, document, you distribute it, you have everybody sign it, whatever, and then you put them into an organization unit that enforces that written policy. Great. Um, just scanning through here to see if we have any more questions. I think um, I think we pretty much covered everything. Uh, Justin, if you want to sign off or wrap it up. Well, that was it for me. You know, again, great time. A lot of great stuff from Kyle and all the other presenters. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Justin. It was a pleasure having you here. Um, all right, so I'm just going to wrap up the presentation real quick. So I'm going to go back in to our uh, into our deck for the last time. And so thank you again, Justin. Great, another great presentation. Um, it was it was a pleasure having you here. Like I said, for the very first session and and the last session. Uh, just a reminder, Guru University is our uh, end-user training tool that's available to everyone. It's at googleguru.com slash university. We have three different courses available there, very comprehensive. So whether you are an end-user who is looking for training materials for yourself or if you're an admin who wants uh, some, some good materials to push out to your users, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, and like I said, it's it's very comprehensive. So if, uh, if you're a beginner or if you're an experienced user, there really is something for everyone there. Um, I wanted to say a, a big thank you to all five of our presenters. Um, Michael Rothenberg from Flash Panel, Michael Spadaro from Profound Cloud, Kyle Horst from Kirksville Web Design, uh, James Ferreira from AppScript, and again, uh, Justin Gale from BRP. It was, it was great having all of you here and I think there was a, a ton of great material. Uh, hopefully, everyone learned a lot. This is uh, this is the first time we did an admin training week, and the response from all of you has been uh, fantastic. I think everybody uh, seems like you you learned a lot, and the uh, the participation was was phenomenal. I think we saw people from all over the world. There was people from Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, the UK, Canada. United States, all over the United States. Um, so it was great to see all of you guys uh, engaged and and really responding well to our presenters. Uh, we'd love to do this again, and we'll make sure to uh, to be in touch with all of you who have given us your information and and let you know when we when we plan to set up another one of these. Um, and I, I'd also like to say for all of you who put down your information for. Uh, free T-shirt and the ebook. 
please uh, be sure to check your email in the next few days. Uh, a lot more people showed up than, or not a lot more, but more people showed up than we anticipated, so we had to increase our, our t-shirt order. So we'll be sending out some information about that in the next few days, as well as uh, the ebook for uh, for the admin training week. So once again, thank you for all of you who showed up. It was uh, we had a great time, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.